Can I get a yeah, man for what we got going on tonight? Welcome back to Calling All Beings. I'm your host, DJ, back from Austin TX, where our special guest is from. And we are here, have a very special episode, one month waiting. And I'm going to tell you, this one's going to be worth waiting for when you see who we've got. And I know because you're here, I know you know who we got. <laughs> so before we do any of that, let's introduce the executive producer and technical director of Calling All Beings, my man, my brother, the co-conspirator in fun, entertaining, and interesting UAP talk, Monet Nathan. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing? Happy Monday. Uh, very excited for this one. Like you said, been waiting a little bit to uh, to have this show, but uh, we've made the impossible possible. We've got the right guest for that tonight. So, <laughs> Dripping with irony. I love it. Uh, right there, just below Nathan, is <laughs> Money Nathan. There it goes. There it goes, Julie. Uh, right there is uh, the researcher and soul and keystone of Cab, the one, the lovely, the talented, the one and only Debs. How are you, Debs? I'm doing great. I'm happy that we can update the archive. <laughs> There's another one. I love it. I love it. And you know, Debs is kind of like a Brazilian barbecue, man, because she's always bringing something to the table. Always. And you know what she brought this time? She done brought this homegirl right there working on her own PhD O double G. Really smart. And we call she is, you know, she's our prospect, right? In this one percent cab gang, she's our prospect, and she is none other than Courtney Connected. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited about being here on the panel tonight with Dr. Jeffrey Kripal. Oh, she just announced it. The man himself, the chair of religious studies and thought at Rice University, the man who is the caretaker, the curator of the archives of the mostly impossible, but possibly possible, the man himself, Dr. Jeffrey Kripo! Man, Dr. Kripo! I am so not as cool as you all are. Oh, you are... <laughs> you are so much cooler, man. Oh, no, no. I am boring compared to you all. <laughs> you know what? Um, you're Our friend, uh, James Eindoli, is like, this guy, Dr. Jeff, you know, you've got to have him on. I was like... Would you like give us like, would you like give us like the go ahead? You know, would you tell Jeff we're, we're okay? And he's like, yeah. I was like, dude, done. After hearing him talk, I'm like, yes, we definitely want him on Calling All Beings. And last time you were amazing. And this time I, I know you'll be equally amazing. And that kind of like, Jeff, kind of brings me to like the, the first thing, which is for those of you who are PhDs in this topic, it's sort of, um, it, it th th there's a lot of pressure, you know, people, uh, have you on their show and they want answers. They're sort of doing the Jack Nicholson, you know, kind of thing. They want the truth, you know, all this kind of stuff. And they want you to unlock these mysteries of, of the unexplained. And, and I thought of you the other day, actually, I was in, in the, in the, uh, grocery store and I sort of bought that, uh, Dave's natural bread. And I came home and I was thinking of you and, <laughs> It, 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 it begat the first question. And the question was, you know, you, 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 you have this sort of organic bread and you, you take the little white thing off after you untie it. And then you can never find that, that fastener. So I'm, I'm wondering what happens to that fastener, Jeff? I, d I don't know. DJ. I, I, I really don't explain. No, no, I don't know. <laughs> Something's happening to it. And we just, we just don't know. Maybe it's, Sean Kirkpatrick. Yeah, it's sort of like the sock, right? It's the sock, the sock, yeah. Sock of the dryer. It just, <laughs> it just disappears. Yeah. It's going to apparate. I'm going to tell you one for real, Jeff. All kidding aside, I, I sleep with a mouth guard, obviously, to keep my teeth from grinding. And if I don't put it in a mouth guard case, it, I've had two of them literally disappear. 
And I have three cats in the house, full disclosure. I do not know what's happened to those mouth guards. So now it goes in the case every night. I don't know. So anyway, all right, let me turn you over to Money Nathan for a serious question while I, I kind of regather myself here. Okay. So, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> that, was, that was incredible. I just want to say thank you for that. Um, so Jeff, it's great to have you back with us. Uh, we really had a great time with you last time. Uh, I wondered kind of how you're doing, right? So the more that you've been out there in the space, the more that you've been talking about, you know, the impossible things that clearly do happen in the human experience, you're probably hearing more impossible things or more impossible sounding things. How are you navigating kind of the probably the deluge of information that you're dealing with now in that space? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, my sense is that it's overwhelming that, you know, people, people are, ha people have these experiences all the time. And um, when you speak about this in public and when you try to, try to do this in public, then people write you, of course. And I get all of these long emails and I, I can't answer them, Nathan. I, and it's not, it's not that I can't answer them. It's just that there's not enough time in the day. Um, so my feeling is that, that it's, that we're in this ocean mm -hmm. of, of impossible experience and there's no capacity to, to really deal with it and to create a community at least yet. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm curious too, in your in the academic community that you're a part of, have you heard from more academics who have said, "Oh, you know, Jeff, you kind of given me a chance to tell you about this story that I haven't told anybody before." Yeah, no, I I think I think academics are first of all, I love academics. I I think intellectuals are really cool. I and I think they want to talk about these things, and they they know that they happen. What they don't want to do is sound like the tabloids. Mm. And so they're looking for a voice or they're looking for language to talk about things that they know happen all the time. And maybe they've had the experience. Maybe their brothers have. Maybe their mothers have. Maybe their grandmothers have. But there's someone in their family. There's someone in their immediate network of who have had these kinds of experiences. And they actually have the tools uh, and this is sort of my message to them. They have the tools to to talk about these things. And particularly if they, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, but if they have tenure, I, I don't know why they're not talking about it. I, I really don't. Uh, I, I, I tell my graduate students not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't let them do this in a dissertation, frankly. I don't, because I want them to get a job. I want them to get employed. But once they're employed, they're safe, and the the academy is a, a pretty friendly place for these sorts of questions. But you have to you have to be in it, uh, unfortunately, um, to 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 do this. And but once you're in it, you're in it, and you can do it. So so do it. That that's sort of my message. Love it, Debsy. Yeah, so first of all, I hope you're archiving all of those emails, just like Whitley did with the, the letters he got. Um, so I guess I was wondering what would be next for the archives? Is there going to be an evolution because of the deluge of contact and interest? Um, what will be the next stage for the archives? Yeah, so Deb, the archives... I mean, so I, I've been on sabbatical all year, and I've spent a lot of time, months, really, in the archives. And the sense that I get from them is a kind of hopelessness um, or maybe humility, maybe is the better way to put it. There's just so much in there. I, I don't know how any one person can possibly absorb all of that. Um, I mean, there are 15 collections now. In the archives, there's there's well over a million documents, well over a million, and so any one person who comes to them, I think, is going to be overwhelmed with just the amount of data, and so we're we're kind of in this process of anonymizing and digitalizing, and applying some kind of AI to 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 the archives that to to sort of you know get some sort of data out of them that can be useful. Um, so I, it's, it, it's frustration, I guess, is, is what probably what you're hearing, Deb, or kind of 
humility or or just a sense of awe in the sense of the vastness of it all i will say i felt the same when i saw all the government documents there yeah. are so many and they're by the way side note more than people realize because the CIA, for instance, was clever in not putting all of them in their designated folders. So, yeah, I understand. Of course. Yeah, I mean, so uh, some of our some of our archives are actually declassified and they were originally, you know, classified documents. The government, I mean, the the intelligence communities have their own reasons for classifying things and but those are also public documents that eventually become public and become available. But just becoming available doesn't mean that somehow some kind of secret is dumped. Uh, you know, the, the secret is, is, is embedded in, in the documents, in the data, but it's not apparent really to any particular... I mean, you can't just go in, into a letter or a series of letters and suddenly find the secret of the universe. Um, it just it just doesn't work like that. Homegirl. Uh, so I don't know if you've met. Have you met Courtney already? Yes, our, we, our we have met a couple of times, actually. One at the Archives of the Impossible on the street as you were getting out of your car. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that or not. but No, I don't, Courtney. It no. was wonderful. I mean, there was a gathering of us, all these high-level people walking in together. It was quite amazing. And yeah. then we also we also met again at the Soul Symposium. Okay. Yeah, so, you'll remember her as the sort of UFO interested researcher who should be donating hair to her host <laughs> and colleague, me. Yeah, so, and by the way, awesome shirt. By my I'm hair. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Kripal, I just I have a, a just a quick follow up question for you. Nothing, you know, major or in huge depth. But I remember at the Archives of the Impossible, Jacques Vallée gave his wonderful presentation. He talked about his experience with UFOs, and he talked about his collection that was coming into the archive. Um, but I remember there was some parameters around it that they weren't going to be public just yet. What was the date again where they were going to be public, and and um, what actually was going to be in his archives? If you could just refresh our memory. Yeah, so, so actually Jacques' collection is what initiated the archives. Um, and please just call me Jeff, Courtney. It's okay. I'm, I'm a casual person. Um, you know, Jacques really, well, Jacques approached me in 2014 and in Berkeley, actually. And he was asking about how, if I could help him with some kind of university archive. And his interest was basically that, yes, his collection could go out on the antiquarian market and, fetch a certain amount of dollars, but it would just disappear, you know, in, into the into the ether, as it were. If it came to an archive, it would be preserved, and then future researchers could look at it and come to their own conclusions. Um, but, Jacques, you know, Jacques was really concerned about, I am sure, the 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 information in his archive and also his own mortality. Um, I don't want to speak for him, but he put a 10 year moratorium on the, the collection and the collection came in. It's come in in four different parts, three parts and, and in the near future, a fourth part. And each of those collections have a 10 year moratorium on them. So it's complicated to explain the first moratorium's up in 2028, by the way, uh, and then 2030 and, you know, 2032 or 2034, whatever the, whatever the, the 10 year moratorium is. So it's, it's complicated that that particular collection is complicated. The other thing that, that we have to do because it's a university archive is we have to take it through something called IRB which means Institutional Review Board. And the IRB is set up really for medical records and for um, chemistry and biology and these sorts of disciplines. But we also want to follow it very rigorously. Um, and because some of the archives involve personal information, including medical information, 
we have to be really careful with some of the collections, um, particularly the John Mack collection, which is our most recent collection. Um, so it's it, it's complicated, Courtney. That, that's all I'm going to say. Although it won't be complicated for the far future or the I guess the near future, it's just complicated for us right now. I, I would, you know, I, before I get to my own question, I just want to follow up on Courtney's because you made me think. Both of you made me think of a, a tangent here that may be interesting. Given that there, there's several, as you said, you know different iterations i'm assuming that you have had a chance to see okay so personally what is the most compelling for you it, with full knowledge that everyone in this panel may be compelled by a different a different work or a different aspect of it but what's the most compelling to you that moves you i i think the experiencers um i i, I think the it's hard it's hard to um locate a particular file or a particular um, document, but just the experiencers who have had these encounters and have been ontologically shocked by them is deeply moving to me. Um, I take the experiencers seriously, which means I think that what they're reporting actually happened to them, but I don't, take their experiences at face value. Um, I think whatever is ex whatever they're experiencing, they're experiencing in a kind of code. So there's a kind of, I don't want to say a deceptive quality to the phenomenon, but there's a kind of camouflaged quality to the phenomenon that, it, that really strikes me as, as, a, um, as a historian and a humanist. Um, and the integrity of the experiencers you know, combined with this sort of deceptive or camouflage quality of what they're experiencing is really what strikes me the most, I think. I think that's what compels me most about the topic as well. Yeah. And I, I wasn't expecting like a specific case. You answered it exactly the way I just, you know, the tangent of it, which genre of it. Uh, my, my personal question for you is, um, do you think that an opportunity exists where perhaps yourself and some of your colleagues like Diana and others that are uh, from the religious studies uh, community, if you will, could possibly engage with leaders of organized religion in, in search for a message that, that they could sort of convey uh, to their, uh, what, what would you call them, uh, Nathan, their, um, their individual churches? I'm sorry, yeah. I know there's a, a yeah, the believers basically the religious yes. followers flock. There's many different terms for it. Yes. So by Diana, I assume you mean Diana Pasolka. Yes, sir. That yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so Diana's a good friend and a colleague. I, you know, so there's this conversation in the study of religion on whether the religions can essentially handle what most people would call disclosure. And there's sort of the far spectrum over here, I guess over here now, is that because of this vertical dimension that the religions possess, that they're capable of handling disclosure. But there's also this, this position over here on the left, I guess, um, or the right, whatever that is to you, that they can't handle it. And that the metaphysical or the ontological shock is so great that it's it's not it's not translatable into any of the particular religions. I I'm actually more of the latter camp. You know, D Diana is more of the former camp. Uh, I think Diana is more inclined towards the position that the religions can handle it. I'm more inclined to the position that they can't handle it. And. So you're Colonel Jessup. Back to the Colonel Jessup metaphor. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm right, um, but I'm deeply, I guess I'm deeply suspicious of the religions themselves. Um, I like this vertical dimension. I think they're correct that there's a, some kind of transcendence or some kind of other other reality that's breaking into the human reality. So in that sense, I think the religions are really useful. 
but their content or their specific revelations, I think, are largely incompatible with what the UFO or the UAP phenomenon is suggesting. Um, and so I guess I'm more skeptical of whether they can handle um, the full the full brunt of, of, of disclosure. And of course, disclosure presumes that this is going to get down a rabbit hole, but disclosure presumes that somebody knows the secret and and so we're going to disclose the secret. I actually don't think anybody knows the secret. I agree. Um, I, I I think that the government and the the military and the intelligence community and the religions, I think they're all essentially hiding their own ignorance around yes. it. Um, and so I'm I'm much more of that camp than I than I am of the oh it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we'll we'll absorb yeah. the, the revelation. I'm like, no, you won't. No, you won't. You, just to support your point, not that you need my support, but Jim Semivan, who apparently was much higher up in the CIA than I was aware, like operations officer, you know, like at that level of like, you know, operations command, if you will. He said as much. He said they don't they don't know what this is. They can't explain it to you because they don't know. Right. And that, and they don't like to try to explain things they can't explain, which is consistent with what I know about government. So I mean, so I know I've I've met Jim, and I I've spent some days with Jim as well. And I, I, my own feeling about the intelligence community and the military and the government is that they have particular tasks that they're concerned about, and this this ain't one of them. <laughs> uh, um, and so when you know when they say this is not our our prerogative or this isn't in our so I, I believe them. I think they're correct about that. I, I I think this is a kind of shock to the the system, the the sort of the sort of reality system that people inhabit. And I don't think it's the job of the government or the military or their intelligence to, to negotiate our reality, as it were. Not in the mission statement, Nathan. Go for it, brother. No, I doubt there is. <laughs> uh, so, so, Jeff, I come from a, a religious uh, background. I was in seminary, uh, got the seminary degree, left the church a long time ago. But I grew up with uh, the historical critical method of analysis of the text. I grew up in a progressive you know, yeah. Christian heritage. And um, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means you know, kind of looking at the, the text, the religious text with a very critical eye, trying to understand the context of the day and and situate that text within the context and the and the cultural context of the time so that you you kind of try to view it from how the people of the day when it was written may have understood the text rather than taking our sort of current cultural position and imposing it upon the text and you know found that to be fairly useful but that approach also at least when i was growing up really discarded a lot of the more phenomenological aspects <laughs> Uh, of religious text right so here we are now kind of at a, at a place in the 21st century where we're beginning to re-examine some of these accounts and i think take them with a little bit more seriousness than we may have in the past so do, do you see the way forward kind of reclaiming some of this uh you know that we've some of the parts of ourselves that we've discarded what does it look like as we move forward here. So Nathan, what kind of seminary were you in? What was it? Uh, I was in a, uh, so my professors were uh, ex Southern Baptists. Let's put it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was trained in that tradition as well. I mean, I, I it was the Rome, it was a Roman Catholic seminary, but it mm -hmm. was very much the historical critical method. You know, the way the historical critical method works is, it basically throws out miracles, right? That's it throws right. out all the strange stuff, and it focuses on the stuff that it can understand historically and, and textually. I think what you're what you're getting from this phenomenon, certainly what you're getting from me, as a kind of third space. It's it's not the it's not the Southern Baptist belief system. I'm not I'm not asking anyone to believe anything. But it's also not the historical critical debunking or contextualization. I I think that basic religious beliefs are are based on actual human experiences. 
And so there's a there there. But it's a there there that doesn't stay faithful to any particular religious content or any particular religious scripture. And that's difficult for people to hear. Um, it's difficult for the religious believer to hear, but it's also difficult for the skeptical or secular person to hear because I think there really is something being communicated that is not historical, that is not social, that is not even natural, that's being that's that's intervening in our world. But I don't happen to believe the content of this scripture or that scripture or this faith or that faith, because I think those are all historical deposits of other people's religious experiences, which made sense to our ancestors, but, but simply don't make sense to us anymore. Right. So, so there's a there's a kind of there's a kind of paradox here. There's a kind of affirmation of the religious inbreaking, but there's a deep skepticism around the traditional interpretations of that inbreaking. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and I find that we we sort of forget that we should be applying a historical critical method to our own methodology of analysis, right? So we tend to think that we've kind of escaped that somehow. Um, I, you know, my, my joke, my joke, Nathan is why are your, why were your advisors in graduate school omniscient? Why, why were they gods? You know, why, why are the critical theorists whom you happen to, to think or believe, why, why are they right about everything? And why can't we apply the same historical critical methods to their thought that we apply to everything else and and be skeptical of our own worldview? Um, and I think that's what we're being called to do is, is sort of step out of our worldview or our belief system and sort of question it. And again, that's hard mm. because pe people want answers. Oh, yeah. they, they want me to tell them what X, Y, or Z is. And I'm like, no, I... I actually don't know what X, Y, or Z is, and neither do you, by the way. Um, so let's let's be honest about that, and and that that's a difficult position to be in, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deb. So I had to comment before I asked my question when you were talking about the AI. What flashed through my head was. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. And I feel like you are striving to find the answer to the universe. Right. And I think that that is a ridiculously lofty goal. And right. if you do get the answer of 42 when you have the AI run, let me know. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that you should put that much pressure on yourself. That robot took thousands of years to give the answer 42. Right. Um, so I wanted to switch to, you talked about worldview, and a lot of people may not have picked up on the fact that you are paying attention to the phenomenon as a global issue. And it's yeah. really important to me. I'm really trying to talk about that as much as possible. I was wondering if you've noticed any patterns in looking at the phenomenon that way that people are missing because they get so caught up in their country and one group of countries. Yeah, I mean, so one, one of the common mistakes people make is they think it's an American phenomenon. They, they, you know, they think the UFO, oh, it's just an American obsession. And what they're, of course, doing is they're confusing the Hollywood reception and, and interpretation of the phenomenon with the with the total phenomenon or with the total total UFA or UAP um, reality, and what you see if you look at this is that it's a global phenomenon and that it happens everywhere, um, and that it it's always been happening actually, and it gets picked up by different cultures and it gets translated into religions or nation states today in a particular sort of way. But those those ways it gets picked up are, are are just as much reflections of us as they are of the phenomenon itself. And I think that's what you really take away from the global picture is that the individual interpretations are are cultural and and historical, and they're not absolute. Um, 
so that's uh, that's what at least what I take away. I'm very much a comparativist, Deb. I I think of things comparatively. I think of things cross culturally. I don't I don't think that this is um, just an American obsession or 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 an American military concern. I think this is something that's been happening for a long, long time all over the world. And what would you say the biggest pattern is? Like the, that's the, that was the big, big part yeah. of it. What is the pattern? <laughs> so the the pattern that I so there's a couple there's there's a number of patterns I see. Um, one is that it, it looks a lot like us, <laughs> but it's not us. So it's sort of like us, but not us. If if you gave me enough beer or enough oh. alcohol, um, yes, we can. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, <laughs> I mean, go ahead. Well, there have been there have been podcasters who have yes. actually sent me back packs of beer. I, if you gave me <laughs> enough alcohol, I would probably say I think it's a future us. I I, I think I think it's us, um, and the reason I say that is, first of all, it communicates with us. Um, and it looks sort of like us, but it doesn't look like us. It looks like me more than you. Actually, yeah, yeah it looks like DJ. Um, no, but it, and and so that's a pattern I see. The other couple patterns I see is one is it, in, it somehow involves sexuality. There's a lot of sexuality and gender and and orgasm and sexual fluids going on. And genetics, and you name it. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And the other pattern I see is trauma. Um, I see a lot of people who are opened up to this this reality through through their own personal trauma. And that might be physical trauma, that might be emotional trauma, that might be sexual trauma, that might be a lot of different forms. But I I do see a kind of traumatic um, pattern here. And I don't, and I don't say that reductively, Deb. I'm not reducing it to the trauma. I think the trauma somehow opens people up. It just it it puts a hole in people, and and they they can be they can be impinged upon them more easily. I like to think of it as the aperture gets opened for survival yeah. reasons. Yeah. Courtney, you're up. Okay, so I'm going to try to tie a couple different ideas together. I had one, but a couple other came up as um, we all got talking. So I remember at the archives of the impossible, you said something. It was one of my biggest takeaways. Was that, um, and I might be saying this wrong, so correct me. But you had you had said, well, the future has already happened because we were talking about retro causality. We were talking about the white knight sure and statistics and all these different things. And that was like one of the overarching things that you said that I was like, wow, he said it. And then one of the other things that I saw was that there were a lot of experiencers there that had needs, that they had like palpable needs for answering of questions. And that really wasn't the right venue for it, but there was this subculture of people there talking about their experiences. And so one of the other things I was thinking about asking you coming into this was um, I come from the humanistic approach as well and psychology. I didn't have religion, but cross-culturally, you know, you explore a lot of that and art and other wonderful things. And so I wanted to ask you about those experiencers that are searching and also their self-awareness. And it's a concept I've been exploring for a little while, like when experiencers have these experiences and they're using self-awareness to understand what it is, what advice do you give experiencers when they run across that camouflage or that that interface of something other that they don't necessarily know how to interpret? We have heard that there's some type of conditioning. When they are faced with that, how do you help them with their self-awareness to move through it in the best possible way? I mean, like, what would be your advice? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I know it's hard. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but, like, have you seen things that work? No. No, it's okay. Um, first of all, the experiencers challenge me. I, I, I'm not. I don't present myself as an authority over these things. I, I really want to think out of their experiences. That's in a very collaborative way. I, my sense is is that the experiencers push us towards a kind of physical um, reading of a lot of these events that. 
um, goes against my own training. You know, we we want to in the study of religion, we want to read things psychologically or or spiritually or or imaginally to use a fancy word. But the experiencers push us to see these things more physically, and I I want to hear that and I want to be challenged and I don't want to present myself as some kind of authority. On the other hand, I want to authorize their experiences. And th this is really important. I think the most important thing we can do is frankly listen and take their experiences seriously, by which I mean not reduce them to our worldview. So when I listen to an experiencer, I'm not going to say, oh, well, you experienced X, Y, or Z, or, <laughs> right. you know, th this was because of your own re religion, or this was because of your, <laughs> your emotional history or whatever. I'm like, no, no, no. Do not reduce what is being challenged here to something that is comfortable to you, the something you already know. And I think it's that act, frankly, Courtney, that is so powerful to people. Um, because for better or for worse, they do perceive me as an authority. I, I, I think that's a mistake, by the way. But they do. And they perceive the research university as authorizing a particular form of inquiry. And I think that's correct, actually. And that's what I most want to do. And what I most want to help with is essentially mainstreaming this inquiry inside, inside an academic box, as it were. Not, not because the academic box is perfect or because academics are, are somehow smarter or something. It's because that's a place in our culture where we can take things seriously and we can integrate them over many, many generations. And so that's what I most want to do is I want to make this thing intergenerational. It isn't about Jeff. It's not about Courtney. It's, it's about our children and our children's children and this inquiry over many generations until we can change our worldview and change the story that we live in in a way that I think is is being called for here. And, and, and really that's how I see a lot of these experiences and a lot of these impossible events. I think they're, they're deep, deep shocks to our stories. And by our stories, I mean our cultural stories. I mean our sense of reality. I mean what we really think is real and, and what we most value. And I think we're being called out of that. Um, and I know people, you know, who, who suffer because of those stories. And they, they, they need another story. And, and, I, and I think we're not there at the moment. And, and maybe... Maybe we don't, we're never there. You know, maybe, maybe human beings are always in the process of telling new stories. Like, and, and I'm sure the new stories we tell, our great-great-grandchildren are going to say, well, that sucks. You know, that, that's a stupid story. You know, let's, let's tell a different story. Okay, tell a different story. Be a different person. Be a different human being. But you know what? Your grandkids are going to think you suck too. And, and so... Th that's the process that that I want to um, encourage uh, and 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 authorize. And I just I happen to be in the academy, so okay, that's what I do, Courtney. It, it's not it's not that it's perfect. I, I think filmmakers and novelists and graphic graphic novel writers. I mean, there's all kinds of people who can do this in a way that's more effective, I think. But but I'm not in those worlds. So I, I, I don't I can't do that, those things. Actually my contemporaries now think my story sucks. So I can only imagine <laughs> when we get 20, 30 years down the line. I mean yeah. people are gonna be like, not only didn't I want to hear it, I really, really don't want to hear it now. So anyway <laughs>
Dr. Jeff, again, I just want to reiterate your shirt is outstanding and we may have to compare notes on, on our clothiers uh, offline. Uh, but, but Jeff, I wanted to, let me frame this up for you before I ask for your reaction. So this is, um, staff Sergeant Dan Sherman, former, um, he was an ELINT specialist trained as an ELINT specialist, electronics intelligence in the air force. He wrote a book called way above black, which you may or may not be familiar with. Oh, I'm not. And, um, it's a very short to the point 60 page book of him going to read in to, he was a police uh, security police in the Air Force going to Elint, and when he got taken to Elint school, he, which was a top secret program, he was pulled aside and said, we want to read you into a gray program, which is umbrellaed by the black program. So people in the Air Force know about the black program. Nobody but a very select group is going to know about this gray program. We want you to be an intuitive communicator with extraterrestrials. And the reason that we want that is because your mother was abducted in 1960 and then she was abducted again in 63 when she was pregnant with you and you were, let's call it enhanced. And he was, oh my God, am I a hybrid? Am I this? Am I that? And they're like, no, you're just having an attenuated ability that all of us have essentially. So. Um, I watched an interview with him that's quite old, probably from the early 2000s, and I read his book. And I want to just get your reaction to the sentence about religion and God. And this came up because I heard you say on a podcast, God is us. And I, I, I love that quote. I wrote that quote down. So if you will, just indulge me for a second here. I'm going to put on my glasses on my glasses. Okay. <laughs> being brought being brought up in the Christian faith, I naturally had quite so he finally figured out how to communicate with these ETs on a higher level that was not the information that they were asking him to communicate about. And so religion is is the, the subheader here, and he says, one question I remember quite clearly was when I asked if they, the ETs, had a soul. As was usually the case, his answer was quite curious. Perhaps someone reading this will be able to understand it better than I. He said that any entity that realizes its own existence has intellect and therefore must have a soul. We, meaning us and them, the ETs, have been created from the same oneness. Parenthetical, my interpretation. And out of that creation came intellect and non-intellect. There are only forms of life in the universe. They are the only forms of life in the universe. We are both them and us, along with many other parts, a part of the intellectual aspect creation. When asked if there was a God, he said something like, the question you ask answers its... He said he's not qualified to answer that question, but he said something like, the question you ask answers itself. So there you go. Um, is that how does God is us play into that? And do you agree that maybe there was this one power that created us and them? So that's a that's a big question. Um, it's a guess. I mean, we don't know. It's just a well. Okay, so. First of all, we know that there are a lot of traditions in the history of religions that deal with different forms of intelligence all, all the way up to, to God. And we know that there are systems of human beings becoming God that are what we call apophatic, that you know they say away or they deconstruct notions of some kind of objective or, or some kind of personal God. What I hear in a lot of the, the extraterrestrial talk is what we would call demonology or angelology in a kind of Christian theological context if we were living in a medieval wow. um, worldview. And I don't hear, I, what I don't hear a lot is what I would call mystical literature. In other words, um, human beings who are affirming their own divinity and who are affirming their own 
deification, but in an apophatic or a, or a non-saying or deconstructive mode. And so I, I worry, frankly, I worry about people who are naive, I, I wasn't going to say naively. They're naively imposing a kind of religious framework on what is essentially a demonology or an angelology. And they're not aware of these mystical traditions in which human beings are, are essentially identical to, to cosmic unity or deity. And what, what I really think, DJ, is that we're selling ourselves short. Um, and that we're not aware of our own um, our own godness, as it were. Hmm. And that if we were aware of this, and if we listened, if we actually, what I what I, this is going to sound self-serving, but what I most want these people to do is listen to historians of religion. Just stop it. Just stop it. Stop talking like you know what religion is when you really don't. And listen to people like Nathan here who actually know something about it and who can tell you all about it. And so, and, and sometimes you do see that, like Matthew Roberts, for example. I don't know if you've had Matthew on. Of here. course. Oh, no, but we know him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Matthew is very explicit that what you really need to do is talk to scholars of religion and scholars of. of the psychology of religion in particular, if you really want to understand what's going on, go talk to them. Don't go talk to the physicist or the, the rocket scientist or the, the chemist. Talk to the historian or the psychologist or the, the philosopher. And I, I just happen to think that's correct. Um, and we haven't done that culturally. I mean, I can tell you in all certainty that our culture has dismissed um, people in the humanities and the and the in the his and history and philosophy and because we we don't know anything um and i say that with sarcasm uh of course we know all sorts of things but they don't want to listen to us um and so let me let me give you an example so when nasa puts a panel together to study the potential of extraterrestrial intervention yeah. Guess who they put on it? They put on a bunch yeah. of scientists. Yeah. Okay, well, where's the humanist? Where's the historian? Where's the philo the the answer is there is none. Uh so of course they're not gonna understand what's going on, you know. Um, and so that's what I think needs to happen is we need to stop listening to the and and I love physicists and I love chemists and I love I'm not dismissing these people, but please stop listening to them and start listening to the historians of science and to the philosophers and to the humanists who actually know something about what's going on. And, and then we will get somewhere, but we're not going to get somewhere until we do that. So if they would have added like DJ, Nathan, Debs and Courtney, they would have been exponentially more prepared yep. to understand what's going on. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really disagree with that. Yep. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Nate, that's, <laughs> the, money. that's actually what I'm saying. And, yeah. Well, it seems, uh, you know, Jeff, we've, um, for the longest time now, we've really located reality outside of ourselves. Um, we, have, we have denigrated our own experience in favor of what's taking place outside of it. Right. And, and trying to say that that's, you know, all that there is. And in the process, we've kind of reduced ourselves to, to a, a non-player in the story. Right. Right. So um, I, for me, like that, that, that's the power of this subject. It's the power of this, I, it, really the encounters that I have with experiencers. And I, I'm not an experiencer, um, but in a sort of coming at their truth, you know, from a, a place of seriousness, as you would say, uh, you know, really does, I think, re-enchant or yeah. re-situate reality yeah. um, away from what we all have, I think, been ingrained in. And that's this kind of very strongly materialist, yeah. you know, worldview. And so, you know, it, what's odd to me about that, I want to get your comment on this, is 
how refreshing that is to the human experience, right? It's if you count, encounter people who are doing this, it's incredibly incredibly refreshing to them. They they are energized by this uh, process of reexamining their own experience, and in a way, the phenomena seems to be giving us permission to kind of do that again, or or invite us. It's more of an invitation. Let's put it that way to to do that again. Have you found similar response from people that you know have really engaged on this topic and, and, and come to it with uh, with that kind of earnest and fresh perspective. I think what you find, <clears throat> this is a general comment, Nathan, but I, I think it's fair. I think what you find if you talk to the people who really engage the phenomena is that it ultimately leads back to consciousness. And, and by consciousness, I don't mean Nathan or Jeff or Deb or Courtney or DJ, I don't mean the ego. I mean some other realm or some other dimension of, of mind that is vastly superior to, to our individual selves. But what you find over and over again is that the phenomena is responding to whatever consciousness or to whatever awareness is brought to it. And it has this kind of, you know, dialogic or, or kind of back backwards sort of um, or loopy uh, nature to it that I think is very difficult for science-minded people because science is really good at explaining everything except us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it actually leaves out consciousness entirely and it does that so that it can explain everything. Okay, you can explain everything, but you can only explain everything because you got to determine what everything is. And if everything includes consciousness, then suddenly you don't, you can't explain everything. And there's a huge hole in your model of the universe called us, called 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 consciousness or mind that just finds no place in this objectifying, quantifying, replicating method. And, and again, that's not to dismiss science or technology. It's just to say it, it's really good at doing certain things, but it's really horrible or bad at doing other things. And I think the excitement people feel around the UAP or the UFO experience is that it brings consciousness back into in, in into the the um, the picture again in a pretty dramatic way that is baffling to to this materialist or scientific um, picture of things but is very familiar to those of us who have who have you know spent our lives living and working and, and interpreting other religious worlds hmm. thank you yep. We covered last time, you know, some of the extraordinary things that humans are doing that the phenomenon can't do. We talked about Courtney's Dutch apple crumb pie at Thanksgiving. We spoke about Deb's hamburger helper. We spoke about Nathan splitting wood in the backyard. And actually, I haven't come up with anything that I can do that they can't do yet. But still, no, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> I never hear about UFOs that look like motorcycles. That's <laughs> true. Oh. That's true. No, actually, one thing I did think of that that just popped into my head this week was kind of how they would look at us. And I thought about a Navy ship. I thought about uh, I think I was listening to maybe Richard Dolan's accounts of naval ship encounters with craft, whether they be aircraft carriers, destroyers or the like. And I thought if I were a non-human intelligence and I had my sensors were picking up this enormous power that is generated by the either the nuclear reactor or other form of propulsion that a lot of these ships have and i decide to hover close and examine it and all of a sudden i'm getting shot at yeah. and you know what i mean all of a sudden the phalanx system is going off and i'm seeing you know 20 millimeter rounds you know headed my way and it's very interesting that they, how must they interpret um, how aggressive that we are, that just appearing is enough for them to be targeted and, and shot at. 
I don't, yeah. have you ever thought about how, yes. how they would? No, sure. No, no, of course. I mean, there's a couple thoughts there. One is I, I don't think these are threats because right. I think if these were true threats, we'd been toast a long mm -hmm. time ago. You know, um, I, I think it's obvious that whatever we're dealing with is so vastly superior to us that it's, it's, it's not even close. So the whole idea of threat just, it makes me laugh. Um, and, but if I were, if I were interested in my own species past, I would be very concerned about the development of nuclear power, for example, uh, because it's essentially a bunch of monkeys um, juggling chainsaws that are going. <laughs> it's it's really dumb. And I also, you know, the other thing that, that I think about a lot is, well, you know, we have this metaphor of AI now because, well, AI is in the news and we think of AI. If I were visiting the tribe of a, of a, of a, of a previous species, I wouldn't go in myself. I'm going to get thrown against the fucking wall. And I'm, I, right. the, 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 the monkeys are violent. I am not going into that, but I'll, I'll send a machine in, you know, that's fine. You know? So I think the whole language and metaphor of, of AI or the machine or the, or the robot, as we used to call it, is actually quite intuitive. Um, to to what what a what a future human would how a future human would actually interact with with a present human, which is very carefully, um, and you know there are star there's Star Trek episodes on this right I mean the the prime direct I mean we have imagined this it's not like this is outside the the narrative of our of our imagination. But we have imagined, and what we know from the history of colonialism, by the way, is it's bad. When one civilization interacts with another and it's technologically superior, it does not go well, okay? It goes really badly. So if you are a technologically superior civilization, you do not want to intervene in the development of of a, of a technologically inferior civilization. Okay. So you just don't, I mean, that, that's just the, that's just history. That's history 101. Um, so I think there are a lot of, again, good reasons that we see what we see. Um, and there are a lot of good reasons that we don't see what we don't see. Like this, you know, this silly notion of landing on the white house lawn. Why in the hell would they land on the white house lawn? I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. Um, and so there What's are the White House. What's the White House to them? You know. Yeah. Well, and also why? Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Why? Why would the farmer show up and talk to the the pigs and the goats and the cows too? I mean, it's just crazy talk, and it assumes a kind of anthropocentrism that we're somehow the superior species in the universe, and I I just seriously doubt that. And and I think that's one of the shocks of this this phenomenon is that it really shows that we're not. Yeah, all the, I mean I don't know if these phenomena could necessarily produce Led Zeppelin and things <laughs> like that, but anyway, <laughs> well, probably not. I mean, probably not. But again, what's what's Led Zeppelin to in the greater picture? I don't know. Well, I, we would have to see what ETs would think of that music. I mean, I, you know, we would have to see what their reaction is. But right. anyway, we don't want to keep you any longer because we, we have hit the one hour mark. Um, and that way, you know, when we ask you to come back for a third time, uh, <laughs> you won't be like, oh, those guys kept me for two hours, for an hour and a half. So um, let's go with uh, Cabby Goodbye, starting with uh, Courtney Connected. It was wonderful having you, wonderful seeing you again. Thank you for answering my questions. So articulate and eloquent. And for the future, I just want you to know that I'm re-familiarizing myself with the flip. And I just have this burning desire to talk with you in the future about cosmic mindedness. Yeah. Sometimes. Courtney, yeah, Courtney, thank you for coming to Rice and and for stopping me. And I, you know, I always apologize. I it, It's, it's, 
it's not my pre-Madonna status. It's just being overwhelmed with a lot of guests and a lot of a lot of details that that I always am. And so so thank you for, for coming. Yeah. Luckily I was with Mike Clellan. So he was like, oh yeah, oh. come over. Come over and meet him. Cause I was like, oh no, no, I don't, I don't want to impose upon him. He's like, oh, I'll be fine. So he yeah. was my lead in. <laughs> yeah, no, my, Mike's cool. Yeah, yeah. no, it's it's cool. Thank yeah. you. Like I said, Courtney connected. Go ahead, Debs. <laughs> I wanted to say, while we've been talking, I just keep thinking of all these things I'd like to talk to you about. Like, that's, that's just how interesting the conversation has been. Um, you know, and I wanted to say also that there are resources that are available for those experiencers that are reaching out to you. Maybe you could just like add Opus's link to their website to your signature when you respond yeah. to people or something like that. So don't yeah. put all of it on yourself. After all, your AI is not going to tell you for thousands of years that the answer is 42. And right. there are there are other humanitarian efforts out there, like the people here that want to help. So if you need help, just let us know. But we very much appreciate everything that you do. You have put yourself as a figurehead in a noble effort. So thank you very much. Yeah. No, I I'm well aware of those networks and, and they're all they're all wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah, Jeff, it's been a real pleasure um, having you back with us. And uh, you've got a book. I'm going to plug your book that's coming up in July. Yeah. It's called How to Think Impossibly. Did I get that title correct? Yeah. And uh, I heard that uh, the forward was going to be written by Philip Ball. Is that is that right? Or he has a comment? Well, Phil, Philip wrote a blurb to it. Okay. He no, there's no forward. There's no forward to it. Okay. If he if he wrote a forward to it, that's news to me, Nathan. Okay, perfect, great. Well, for those who don't know, Philip Ball is, uh, I think, one of the editors of the journal Nature. He's a science yeah. writer, um, so that's a pretty notable uh, blurb to write for your book. Looking forward to that. It comes out July twelfth, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds right, actually. Yeah. Excellent. Well, best of luck with that and the rest of your sabbatical. Well deserved. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back with us again in the future. I hope so. I hope so. You, you guys know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> <laughs> and thank, thankfully you answer us. Uh, and by the way, so cabbies, what we're going to say, I'm going to say goodbye to Jeff here. We're going to let him go. And then we're going to stay on air and promo our new network, the Untold Radio Network. So, uh, but Jeff, before uh, we do that, um, I want to say thank you so much for being willing to come on. Um, I know how many podcasts uh, uh, contact you and uh, we love your work and your positive nature. We'll never forget what you did for our cabbie Matt last time because boy, the some of the paranormal stuff that he has dealt with, uh, I've heard even since that show that he shared is, is quite traumatizing and the way that you handled that I, I know made him feel better and I'm deeply Good. appreciative of that um so uh yeah uh please uh, uh let us know we will promo your book even though you if you're not on we are still going to uh throw it up at the beginning of our show uh well, we're starting with a new network on may 9th but uh okay. thank you so yes sir we're very excited about it and thank you very much for coming and sharing your thoughts and and being such a good sport yeah All right no i'm it's a pleasure really and i mean that it's not it's not a duty or a or a performance it's, it's genuine i'm i'm really glad i'm really glad we had so much fun and you can laugh with us so well we will invite you on for a jeff kripal part three kind of like jaws three but it'll be better than that was <laughs> all right <laughs> I, I, I saw jaws by the way i remember jaws in the 70s i didn't see jaws three so Let's not, let's not go there yeah <laughs> we're close in age i saw jaws in the theater star wars as a 10 year old that'll give you an idea how old i am so yep. <laughs> Th thank you so much brother we'll talk to you soon okay bye-bye take, care. Bye -bye. take Bye. care bye bye all right cabbies um great great job guys i just figured we would uh uh promo the network so may 9th uh, the only place that you guys will be able to find Cab is on Untold Radio Network. Um, I, Nathan, do you have anything queued up we can throw up there? I do not. Uh, I have nothing. Okay. okay, we will we will get it for the uh, for the next show. We'll get something. Uh, we'll get that that tile up there so we can show you the logo and we can have the link and so forth. Um, Jules, you know, you, you'll find all of us there. Jules will be there. Everybody will be there. Hello, Anon. Welcome. Welcome back. And this is 
<laughs> horse love fat. I love that. Somebody's name in the chat. Um, but yeah, so Untold Radio Network, there is a slew of Bigfoot shows, paranormal shows. I'm gonna bring it up real quick just so I can um just so I can t I think this is it right here, Untold Radio AM. I'm gonna put on my spectacles here. Okay. And next week they're gonna be working on our stuff. So uh boy, here's the show. They have a coffee time. Down South Anomalies, Discover Sasquatch, Grasping Sasquatch, Monsters on the Edge, Mysterious Library, Pine Island Research, Paranormal Spectrum, Talking Weird, The Bigfoot Influencers, uh, Sasquatch Outpost, Jim, I really want to get Jim on from Colorado, he's amazing, uh, grew up in Zimbabwe, I think, um, Untold Radio AM and Weird Encounters, um, a wide open research and it says calling all beings archive. So calling all beings is, is already being listed on their site. Um, and they also are owners of hangar one publishing where you can find books on UFOs, Bigfoot paranormal. So they're kind of into the same things that we're into, but take it away, uh, Nathan. Yeah. We're very excited about this opportunity to partner oh, with them back. And, um, the cat the cat is back there she is um, so we're very excited about that um, one of the things that's going to allow us to do is to uh, kind of record some of the shows and then we'll be able to be in the audience and chat uh, while the show premieres so that'll be a fun way for us to interact with folks that we don't normally get a good chance to interact with while the show is happening um, so huge shout out to our listeners and, and followers uh, it's been great to uh, kind of get to this point and hopefully we'll deepen the cabbie network further and grow the cabbie community yeah, on um, Debs. I wanted to add that as as far as I know, we will be able to link our videos um, yeah. to the show to the YouTube channel that we currently have. So no one's gonna have to go. Um, where are they go? Where do they go? We're still gonna be out there. I'm excited to be with so many people who are um, seasoned and talking about the phenomenon. So that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to. Um, we're going to be connected to a lot more people who are interested in, you know, Bigfoot, uh, Ghost, and we're going to be one of the only UFO people. But, you know, we've got our stuff together. We're good. <laughs> so it's going to be great. We'll yeah, spread Court, the UFO love. I, that's what I was going to say, Court. They're basically, they're looking to plus up their UFO content. Uh, and that's why I think they were interested. They, they've been on with us, or Doug Highcheck. Doug Highcheck, um, sorry, man, Hera's going to take, I think this is how Katiani punishing me by sending Hera, Hera the Destroyer in here because she truly is the disruptor in the house. Um, but anyway, and she's going to claw me here in a second. But um, <clears throat> Doug is the producer of Monster Quest, those of you who remember that. He's also done work for Nat Geo uh, and other networks uh, and uh, Legend Me at Science 2, which this is the... 2023 he starts shooting oh uh oh now she's got the microphone <laughs> it's so funny um but uh doug starts shooting legend meet science 2 10 years after the first one so he started shooting in 2023 he's not finished yet um uh, but yeah it's a great group of people and i think it'll it'll work out really well you know then what do you think Court? we're gonna bring more ufo content to the bigfoot peoples homie I'm all about it. You know, I'm a big UFO researcher and, you know, kind of a nut, really. So I'm excited about expanding horizons, especially being with Calling All Beings with this partnership. It's going to be pretty fascinating and and lovely to see what takes hold and people that are going to find it, find the content. Yeah, well, well uh, Deb, as you were saying, we'll kind of figure out the, the links, but um, I think they're going to be able to click on that and come to ours. I'll have to get with, uh, we'll get, get into some meetings. In fact, Doug, I spoke with Doug today. He's going to contact Nathan next week about some of the creative aspects of it that um, he's asking me stuff today. I'm like, man, if it has, doesn't have to do with content, don't ask me. I don't know anything. I don't have anything to do with it. That's Nathan. Um, so, uh, but he'll get with you on that. I'll talk with um, uh, Alex Highcheck, his son, about the mechanics of it. And, um, but basically that's where you're going to find us on YouTube and on podcasts is on untold radio network. So, 
uh, Will, Nathan and I kind of will figure out how to make sure we leave uh, that message out there that everybody can can find it on podcasts, etc. But essentially, you'll have to just subscribe. Now, this is not a paid subscription, okay? You can go on your your whatever your podcast app and just subscribe or follow our show, and you're going to get cab every week. It's just that it won't be on the the current cab feed anymore but it's not still not going to cost you anything to to watch or or listen to cab on pod yeah all right what'd you think man dr jeff kripal had i mean he's the best how can you not like jeff kripal (laughs) guy's amazing court what'd you think he's just such a groovy guy and he's you know he's thoughtful he's careful he's considerate very insightful i mean he's just lovely he's a lovely man uh, I couldn't agree more. He's just such a, a kind person. I mean, he is probably getting requests on the level that Gary Nolan is. And, and he said yes to us. And um, it's it, well, you know, maybe not Gary may be getting, you know, because he's on TV a lot as well. You know, he's on news programs. He's probably getting even more. But we really and we did have Gary once. We really appreciate it. Uh, Debs, did we get anything wrong tonight? And how did it go? Oh, I thought it went well. I feel like he really just makes you want to think about so many other things, you know, and you just want to like be that person that tells him your experience for some reason. Like, and his shirt was phenomenal. It was so cool. I know. I'm so jealous, man. Yeah. And I'm going to send him the book from uh, Dan Sherman and see what, what he thinks. But I think, I, I don't know if he believes that it, our government has been in contact with them, which I also, as you guys know, have said it on cab. I didn't believe it. And now I, <laughs> I does ever, is everybody in unison that they believe that now, or are we, no. are we in different camps on this? I'm in a different camp. So I don't think it's the government. I think it's people who are connected maybe to the government who have some of the skills some of the resources, but I don't think that this organization that is doing this stuff is so much the government anymore. Well, what I'm referring to is the Dan Sherman narrative about being trained by the government. It was a joint, I don't know if it was NSA or CIA and Air Force program to to learn how to communicate with them. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, so I think my my thing is, and, I've, and I think I've said this previously, is if you if you broaden your perspective of what that means to be the government, right? If you broaden it to understand that those people may have been trained by the government, may still be working there, um, may still have some connection, but are actually working outside of the government, I think that's where some of this really lies. Well, what he was saying was I was trained at Fort Meade. So if he's saying that he's giving, he changed the names of the people, but he's using ranks and he's talking about the programs and he showed a set of orders. So he's talking about this definitely was a, if you believe it, I mean, you don't need to believe this, but it was a, and what it is now, I don't know. I haven't the slightest idea and I don't have an idea of what happened then. All I know is what he said and w- the way that he speaks about it lines up with, I, I believe that he's telling the truth, but I don't have any knowledge of it. So, so his experience wasn't direct contact though, right? It was, it was communication. So that's different. Correct. What Correct. I'm talking about is the people who are saying that the government is having like direct contact. And I don't think that's happening. I think it's a different group. Mm. I think so. Like he wasn't the first person to come out and say, I've, you know, worked for the government and then we worked with ET, you know, ET essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that there is another group that's doing that work. Um, The physical contact, the like, you know, and, and you hear these stories like that there's a space in a base. It's not always Area 51. And it just mm-hmm. seems to be like there's a pattern. But I just feel like maybe because of liability, even it wouldn't be directly the government. That's all. Yeah. And, and Court, did you do you remember Lou Elizondo sort of retweeted somebody that said, "Uh oh, I'm trying to figure out what Harris doing now. She's trying to open a little closed 
plastic. She's trying to get in the drawer, a plastic container drawer, and pull it open. Dangerous. But there's something blocking it, so she's trying hard to. All right, uh, Court, do you remember Andrew something? Lou Elizondo retweeted, hey, you should listen to this or take this seriously. Do you guys remember? Yeah, Andrew Scott. He had one of the largest uh, buyout deals. I think it was by, I don't know if it was by HarperCollins, but it was by one of the big publishers last year. And then we hadn't heard much about it. Right. Um, and then I, Ross Coltheart also covered it. Lou Elizondo. Uh, and Sean, a couple different people covered that story. And so I haven't heard anything more about the book. To your um, point, though, about the belief system and whether you believe we're contacting them, I just think it's so fascinating how you think no, right? But then as you get exposed to all this material, yeah. you then you start wading in and you're like, oh, I have to accept this and I have to accept this. Well, today I was reading this really in-depth article um, it was written by Richard Dolan and it was Kit Green and he was having him go on the record and Kit Green says multiple times that there's a secret space program, that he knows it, that he encountered mm -hmm. it. He encountered it on multiple occasions. I'm like, look at that. Just going, are you kidding me? Like, I yeah. can't accept yeah. that. I can't accept that right now. I'm just going to store it, put a pin in it and, you know, encounter that later. But it comes in waves where you kind of, you can't refute certain things after a while, after you see it enough in the research money yeah i mean it's very complicated right so i, I mean courtney makes an excellent point there and, and of course david grush made claims about agreements between uh elements of the government and uh some aspect of whatever this is so uh you know i do think that in time we, we will know more but there's a mountain of uh, seemingly a mountain of evidence in the record about you know sort of hinting that there is something to this and some type of contact i don't know how extensive it is um how how active it is uh, but um, there does seem to be at least elements within the government or private and or private industry that have had some degree of, of contact. Um, what what that looks like and, you know, I have no idea. Um, you know, certainly interesting to speculate about for sure. And, and definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know either. I told I didn't believe it at all. I said I don't I told Nathan, I don't believe this is true. And then three things have happened. One was reading this book. And then uh, finding that that interview that Courtney's familiar with from the early 2000s, probably more than a decade after he wrote this book. And then there's a, 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 a friend of mine who you guys are familiar with that's friends with David Grush that's in the Intel community. And that guy told me that he has in an environment read reports about these beings that were held and what kind of things that they experienced and what he read was disturbing as a human. So when he, you know, he sent me, <laughs> he sent me that book and he sent, and uh, I don't think he sent me the interview. Someone else did. That might've been Deb that sent me the interview. Somebody else sent me the interview, but he sent me the book. And then he told me that. And I said, okay, yeah, there must be something to this uh, that they were training people to contact them uh in the probably late 80s and who knows how long how far it dates back because the thing that makes him really believable is how he doesn't embellish on what he, he doesn't tell you what he thinks there's nothing in this book about what he thinks only what he knows he doesn't know how far back it goes he doesn't know how many intuitive communicators there there were he only knew the people in the program that were read in. And when he went to see mental health, um, he never heard from anybody again. Closed, done, after, accounts closed. Don't don't come here. Don't show up, blah, 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 blah. Uh, when he asked about what the information was, where it would go, that he would type into a box and hit send. He has no idea. Don't know where it went. Only that when I figured out what I thought they were coordinates and they corroborated that there were abductions associated with that, I said, I'm out of this game. That's 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 a done, done deal over. So but all the things that you would ask him in an interview, what about this? What about that? And what do you think this? He wouldn't tell you anything about what he thinks. He just tells you what what he knew to be true based on his experience and that was was very powerful, especially 
you know, uh, you know, before we go, I mean, let's we could take nine minutes here, but the the religious aspect, uh, going back to this, if everybody wants to, let me put on the uh, spectacles again. Um, an entity, uh, perhaps uh, an entity that realizes its own existence has intellect and therefore must have a soul. Anybody? You know, <laughs> so here's the thing, Ray. I've I've been down the rabbit hole of what counts as intelligence. Um, and I think that we get really caught up in what we think of it in our terms, human terms, right? So that part, I'm not so attached to, but I do think if you break things down, things that have DNA um, probably have a soul. And, the, you know, some spiritualities would disagree with that. They think there's spirits in everything. Um, so I have to give a nod to that. But I do have a feeling that DNA is a key to the soul. And every living thing on this earth shares... Um majority of our dna meaning us. yeah and not yeah. to be like rough on humans too much but if you look at how even bacteria interact you could be describing humans all this like it goes from that's the smallest form of dna on our planet um <laughs> the interactions are pretty much the same across all species um, so although some of them do a little better than we do, like the fungus, they're pretty much in the cooperative mode for the most part, trying to help each other out, mm -hmm. work on communication. Um, wish we were a little bit more like fungus than bacteria sometimes, but yeah, that's my perspective. I don't know, Deb, I'm a pretty fun guy. Is <laughs> 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 I just want to weigh week. in on the. Please, I just want to weigh in on that book, DJ. I went and looked it up. It's Simon and Schuster had the bidding war over the book, and the the writer's name of the memoir was Scott Andrews. I just wanted to. I just want to circle yeah. back on that because we transposed the yes. name. Yes, we did. So. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that that was. Uh, and when Lou said that, and he tells a very similar story of the the Air Force telling him that his history wasn't what he thought. And then I, I, I'd have to go read that tweet again. I don't know if anybody finds it or, or if anyone knows. Is that a similar narrative or am I conflating the two? We don't know. If, I think it's that, similar, but what's weird is how often that narrative comes out, right? And then if you dig into it, there really are special schools schools for gifted children that you have to like be invited to essentially after applying sometimes there's Professor this, X. No, I'm just kidding. yeah and actually a good example is i think the guy who um created facebook was in one of those at hopkins mark zuckerberg, oh, zuckerberg. yes okay Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a, the whole thing about uh, Gordon Cooper. He was on the record about it. I mean, he was famously quoted uh, talking about the special schools for the star kids. So there's other there's other literature that documents this. Interesting. Oh, well, certainly supports that. Uh, 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 Nathan, uh, we we have been created from the same oneness. And out of that crea creation came intellect and non-intellect. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's um, it, that kind of language. I mean, it's it's a little bit loaded to a certain degree, but you know, it does I think have parallels with non-duality. Um, that you know that we're all sort of a part of the same thing. Uh, we're sort of consciousness exploring itself. Um, so you see those themes popping up pretty often in in the sort of experiencer encounter. Literature, you know, kind of like Jeff said, you know, we we are they, they are us, you know, God is us. So we're, there's this very holistic perspective uh, to all all of life. Um, I'm not so certain that there's maybe kind of this this stark dualism between uh, you know things that are conscious and things that are not conscious. Um, I don't know that I necessarily take that perspective. Um, also, when it comes to the language of the soul, and that's a very loaded term. Um, and so it's, 
you know, you can take that for what you want, I suppose, but I don't necessarily adhere to um, the language of the soul in the kind of the, in the traditional sense of the term. You know, there's this sort of like uh, heavenly realm where souls reside um, that is, you know, kind of distinct and apart from reality itself. So, yeah, it's interesting, though. Interesting that, to kind of get that in the record. Um, and I think that those exchanges are fascinating. You know, we, when we have people that, you know, claim to have spoken with with these beings and ask these types of questions. And, and the responses we get are often kind of cryptic in that way. Um, but they're also, I think, to a certain degree, they're heavily interpreted, right? So Dan Sherman in that example mm -hmm. is, you know, heavily interpreting uh, what he's getting because I think you know he described the method by which he gets communication. It's not necessarily like it's words per se. It's almost like imagery that he's in kind of deciphering in his own words to to make, make sense of it all. Which Can adds I... adds to his credibility, right? Because he could sure. say that this is what he told me, but he's telling you it's only his interpretation of all of that imagery right. into then putting it into English, which. Yeah. What can get lost in there? Oh, I'm sorry, Deb. Go ahead, ma'am. I just wanted to share something. I don't normally talk about this too much. But, you know, when I was doing meditation, which I essentially stopped because it was just too weird. Um, <laughs> but one thing that happened was I was, like, shown that we all have within us God, essentially. Like, but it, they didn't call it God. And then I say they, because in my experience, there were entities there. Um, they said that we all have the source, the God source inside of us. And I took that to mean perhaps it is really literally ingrained in our DNA. And that's what connects everything. So I just wanted to explain that a little further. Like there, it's like a cosmic universe, right? It's an internet so to speak. Um, so we are all a part of that. We're all like little nodes. But that's just, that was just a meditation thing. So, but other no, people have said it too. I think that's dope. Uh, and it's also leads to where we program with this sort of propensity to argue, fight, kill to keep the population of the planet under control because obviously if everybody was trying to help everybody i mean who knows what would have happened to the population and the what the planet could support i don't know if that's something that's been there but let's 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 take what julie's had to say here i was in a gifted program called project up so jules you'll have to uh, tell us about that but let me go to your next point and okay here it is okay not even sure. Well, one of you guys can read that. I'm going to put on these glasses again. Look like I'm at a drive-in theater. I'll Not even it. sure why they had it, but they gave us a pass that we could go on our own chill-out space with a stereo and bay window and stuff when we were done in regular class with nothing to do. So she's talking about the program, the gifted mm. program. It sounds like a good party to me. Yeah, Jules, you'll have to tell us a little more about your program. I know Jules is from Indiana, so I don't know where where this where this was at, but uh, but yeah, um, I'd like to hear more about that, Jules. We'll have to have a a call. But anyway, it's it's time to cut the cabbies loose out this joint from after cab. But I just figured we could talk about um, uh, Untold Radio Network. We'll have some graphics uh for the, our next show and we'll be ready to party who do you, we got coming up next nathan mm -hmm. who are we partying with next check the calendar well here. and i just want to weigh on the intelligence yes ma'am please because i didn't get to but i think trees and other forms of being that might necessarily not have dna i would consider them intelligent <laughs> to interesting wait what does it yeah, have I dna agree. what does it have dna i need to know like obviously we know rocks right they don't but but yeah let me know if you uh want to pass that information on to me courtney i need to know okay so uh, uh, sean bob there. pliskin yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah we will have ex oh look at this Dan danny uh, oh danny danny smith of uh the story of 
podcast. We're going to have those guys on. He's just messaging me that episode's going to drop tonight, which means you all probably won't want to listen to it because I'm on it. Uh, but <laughs> talking Bigfoot. <laughs> but these guys are really cool, and uh, we'll have them on on cab. Um, so, yeah, Sean Munger, who is a man. You want to talk about a a passionate, fiery <laughs> government person that is an advocate of... Oh, wow, no. Is, that is an advocate of uh, the phenomenon. That is Sean Munger. And uh, I would not want to be Sean Kirkpatrick in a room alone with Sean Munger. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so thanks a lot, guys. Any any parting shots before we sign out? Yeah, I wanted to say, and it's funny that Courtney used the term, the program, and, and that, that came up. I think that when we are talking about the actual government working with UAPs, the term the program is what they tend to use, um, which is really interesting. It's like that's the code for it. Yeah, it was also a sports movie back in the early 2000s about <laughs> steroid use, but that's besides <laughs> the point. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Money, Nathan, any parting shots before we go? Uh, you know, I just had a great time in the show today. Uh, great having Jeff back with us and also great being with all of you guys. Looking forward to the next one. And um, yeah, looking forward to being part of the Untold Radio Network. Also, thank you everyone for listening and watching and uh, following along with our show as we've been on this journey with you. And uh, if you like the show, want to hear more, uh, please do give us a like and subscribe. It does help the show. Um, I know we are transitioning to a new network, but it does help us stay in touch with you until we do. So, Courtney, connected. I loved learning about learning more about everyone, like Nathan. I didn't know about your theological history and seminary and everything. It was nice to learn a little bit about your background and your perspective of where you're coming from. And it's always just nice to be involved with the Cabby crew learning and growing and being part of the crew it's very it's very um enlightening in many ways just to have these conversations it's an honor and pleasure to have you we do it a little bit differently but we do it so <laughs> julie thank you so much for being in the chat tonight i'm sorry we didn't get to more we had some very long-winded answers i had a hold back i had a couple more follow-ups because you guys asked such great questions that I wanted to follow up on more of them than just Courtney's. But I was like, man, I got to got to keep passing the baton, baby. So <laughs> for Courtney connected for Debs and for Nathan. This is DJ saying peace out. One love. We'll see you down the road. And as always, we're wondering what's up around the bend. <laughs>